Uh, welcome everyone to the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum free lecture series. My name is Tom Sharpley. I'm the seasonal museum manager. And um, we would like to thank our corporate sponsors, M&T Bank, uh, AARP Vermont, and the North County Federal Credit Union. And of course, we'd also like to thank our lecture partner, CCTV, who is taping this lecture so you can see it later <coughs> on the internet. Um, we have some announcements about doings at the museum in the, in the near future. First of all, we open for the season May 1st. We're open from 10 to 4 every day. So please come visit. On May 5th, we're having a book group discussion. May 5th is the first Sunday in May, and I think it's at 2 o'clock, and we're discussing the book The Fort, which is a novel about the Revolutionary War by Bernard Cromwell. And then the third Sunday lecture, a month from now, May 19th, uh, the author Laura Macaluso is going to discuss Thomas Jefferson's Virginia. <coughs> and uh, some announcements from me. First of all, I'm the, I'm the gardener here. I'm the head gardener here. And just today, before you all showed up, we installed permanent engraved plant signs in the garden. So I've been wanting to do those for eight years I've been wanting to get it, get it together to have those installed. And I finally did it because we've got a new executive director, Angie Grove, who really kicked me in the butt. And you find, go out and look at my new, uh, my new garden signs, please. <laughs> the other thing is, at the end of the meeting, one of you kind people is going to volunteer to stay late and help me move these tables back and move the chairs around. Somebody is going to, is going to volunteer to do that and help me out. Reasonably close. All right. Now I'd like to introduce Dan O'Neill who was the former executive director of the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum. Uh, Dan. Woo! All right. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to rotate this up just so it's there. How's everybody doing? It's good to be back. Good to see you all. Um, I'm actually not here. I'm wearing this because I'm in a semi-official capacity um, because Rob's going to be presenting on the history of Freemasonry in Vermont. And um, I am the currently serving master of Mount Mansfield Lodge number 26, located in um, Jericho. Um, and Rob is a past master of our lodge, as well as Ethan Allen Lodge. And he and I have been friends through Freemasonry for Oh gosh, many years now, and we're um, really proud of all of Rob's accomplishments, and we're really excited to be here to support him. Um, Robert is the award-winning author of 15 books and numerous articles on American history. He earned his master's in American history from Rhode Island College. He's a former National Park Ranger he is currently a senior immigration services officer with U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. He and I are co-workers. Um, he has been a Mason for 13 years. He's the past master of Ethan Allen Lodge number 72 and Mount Mansfield Lodge number 26. Um, he resides in Jericho Center, Vermont with his wife, Elizabeth and his three adorable children, Addison, Mackenzie, and Sawyer. If you ever get to meet them, they are a delight. Um, and also, it should be noted, he is a Libra, and he enjoys long walks on <laughs> historic <laughs> battlefields throughout the country. So please, I'd like to hand it right over to Rob, and yeah. congratulations. Happy to be here. Good afternoon. Always, uh, it's always great to uh, come here to the homestead and uh, find something new and uh, riveting to talk about. Uh, I was here last fall talking about the Civil War, and before that we've talked about John Burgoyne and Guns of the Revolutionary War, and well, just go on uh, Chittenden County TV and I've got probably six or seven talks on there now uh, about the homestead. But uh, the topic that I'm uh, speaking on today is uh, something near and dear to my heart, and as uh, Dan mentioned, I've been a uh, Mason for uh, 13 years, and really what got me into this organization? 
Uh, as a Civil War historian, I would read uh, time and again in books about the Civil War about how in this great war of brother against brother, that time and again, men who are on uh, completely opposite sides would stop shooting at each other to rescue or to talk to a Brother Mason. And those stories uh, really, really interested me. And, uh, well, lo and behold, when I moved to Vermont, I didn't know a single person in this state. And I thought, well, maybe if I join the Masons, I might know somebody. And uh, 13 years in, it's been one wild ride, and I quite literally have brothers and friends from Bennington all the way up to Newport. It's a, a great organization. And the Masons, when you would ask maybe the average person uh, walking around on Church Street, the average person who might have seen one of those uh, History Channel specials over the years would tell you that the Masons are involved in some wacky conspiracy to uh, take over the government, that they, you know, are involved in all of these wild conspiracies from the Roswell UFO crash to the design of the dollar bill. But I can tell you without revealing anything that none of those are true. What Masonry is, is a group of men who truly are a band of brothers, a group of men who work together to not only better themselves, but to better their communities through uh, participation in scholarship funds, uh, providing uh, donations to the needy, uh, cooking for senior citizens, uh, organizing Memorial Day parades, uh, just a small example of some of the things this organization has done. And quite literally, men who are members of this organization, no matter where you go in the world, you quite literally have a brother who would give you the shirt off his back. And I've found that time and again traveling, especially through the uh, South. Uh, it truly is a great organization. And it's an organization that really has been here in Vermont uh, since the beginning, since uh, you know the beginning of the foundings of Vermont. Uh, masonry in Vermont really gets its start during the French and Indian War. A lot of the British regiments that came over here to fight uh, in what becomes the Champlain Valley uh, around uh, Lake George, Fort Ticonderoga, Crown Point, a lot of those British regiments have their own established lodges that they bring with them. Uh, Mason, masonry's origins start Back in the 1300s, in the uh, craft guilds of Europe, in the cathedral builders, uh, really with the stonemasons who are using uh, tools to build the great cathedrals of Western Europe. But by the early 1700s, as those uh, stone guilds uh, transformed more into social clubs, the uh, men who were members of that took the teachings of the stonemasons and really made it into emblems of morality, using the tools to better themselves, not only as tools of building, but to build a moral edifice within the man. And so in 1717, in England, the four lodges that are in London come together to form the United Grand Lodge of England. And in 1717 is really where the modern origins of masonry start. And so about 35 years later, as we're now in the French and Indian War, the Seven Years' War, a lot of those British regiments that are fighting in the Champlain Valley bring their own mason lodges with them to what eventually becomes Vermont. And a lot of those British soldiers end up staying and settling in the Champlain Valley. <clears throat> During the American Revolution, uh, certainly Masons were active uh, throughout Vermont. Seth Warner was a member of great renown, a member in Connecticut, uh, active as the head of the Green Mountain Boys. But Masonry comes to Vermont in its full effect in November 10th of 1781. And that is when the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts charters Vermont Lodge, number 18 in Cornish, Vermont. Now you might think to yourself, have you ever heard of Cornish, Vermont? Well, keep in mind, after the American Revolution, a lot of the towns in the Upper Valley, uh, around Lebanon, Claremont, Hanover area, a lot of those towns on the east bank of the Connecticut River thought, hey, maybe being part of Vermont might be a better thing than being part of New Hampshire. So there's a period where a lot of those towns like Lebanon and Cornish and Hanover 
are actually calling themselves part of Vermont rather than part of New Hampshire. And that really won't get resolved until Vermont is ready for admission to the Union in 1791. But at that time, in November of 1781, Paul Revere uh, just had the uh, 249th anniversary of his midnight ride uh, just the other night. Paul Revere is the Grand Senior Warden of Masons in Massachusetts. And Paul Revere is actually going to sign the charter to establish Vermont Lodge in Cornish, Vermont. And this is the first lodge that becomes part of the Vermont Masonic existence. And the Ver Vermont Lodge, believe it or not, is still around to this day. It still meets, it's still in existence in White River Junction, and hanging on the wall of that lodge is the charter signed by Paul Revere. So in 1782, the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts charters another lodge, and they are going to charter a lodge that is going to be in Manchester. And the lodge in Manchester is going to be called North Star Lodge Number 2. And this is the first lodge that is chartered in what is today actually Vermont itself. And on June 26th, 1785, they're going to initiate two very interesting men that you might have heard of. They're going to initiate Ira Allen and Thomas Chittenden into the mysteries of Freemasonry. Uh, Chittenden and Allen at that time were both living in the uh, Bennington area. And so... North Star Lodge in Manchester becomes the first lodge that is chartered in what is now the geographic uh, territory of Vermont. And that lodge uh, is going to exist until about 1814 when it's going to close down, but it will later be revived as Adoniram Lodge number 46, which is still active in the Manchester area today. And Chittenden and Allen are just some of the very prominent early Vermonters who are very active in Freemasonry. You might have heard of Nathaniel Chipman. Uh, Nathaniel Chipman was the Vermonter who secured Vermont admission to the Union, was responsible for settling the boundary disputes between New York and uh, New Hampshire. Fortunately, we didn't get Cornish. It went back to uh, New Hampshire, but it is a uh, lovely town. I always love uh, driving over the big uh, covered bridge there between Windsor and uh, Cornish. Uh, another one you might have heard of is Moses Robinson, the first United States senator uh, from Vermont. Uh, Nathaniel Chipman, uh, another one of them was men. So just some of the very prominent early Vermonters who are members of the fraternity. Now, where are we today? We are at the Ethan Allen Homestead. And this is one of the great mysteries of studying Masonic history in Vermont. Was Ethan Allen a Mason? And Ethan Allen, the criteria to be a Mason, you have to be a man, freeborn, of lawful age, over the age of 21, and recommended. Uh, Masons don't go out and recruit. You have to go knock on the door, very much like the French Foreign Legion, and ask for admission into the lodge. And the records in Vermont are very interesting when it comes to Ethan Allen, because you read a lot of biographies of him, a lot of material even written way back uh, when. And Ethan Allen never admitted in any of his writings to being a member of the craft, certainly not in his uh, narrative. But a lot of evidence does point that Ethan Allen, while not a member in Vermont, may have been a member in Connecticut. Uh, more than likely, uh, current research uh, indicates that Ethan Allen may have taken the first degree. Masonry is composed of three degrees, uh, the first or entered apprentice degree, the second or the fellow craft degree, and the third or master mason degree. So more than likely, as current uh, research indicates, Ethan Allen took the first degree, more than likely in Litchfield or Salisbury, Connecticut, where he was originally from, but never proceeded uh, further on in his uh, career. I should add that uh, Masons uh, revere George Washington very much. Uh, you can go in almost any Mason lodge in the United States and find a uh, picture of George Washington. Uh, George Washington, as much as he was uh, revered by Masons as being the, the founder, the father of the country, 
was not very active as a member of the fraternity. Certainly, he took his uh, three degrees in Fredericksburg, Virginia, uh, shortly before the outbreak of the French and in Indian War. They actually had the privilege of uh, holding the Bible that he took his uh, three degrees on. But after, after he uh, took that third degree, there's only reference that he ever attended one other meeting at Fredericksburg Lodge Number 4. Uh, certainly, he was a uh, very busy man. Uh, when he is elected president in 1789, uh, he's also appointed as the first master of a new Masonic Lodge in what becomes uh, Washington, D.C., but certainly as president, he had no time to be master of that lodge. Uh, as I can attest, uh, it's almost like having a full-time job on top of having a full-time job and raising a family. So uh, George Washington, while certainly revered by Masons uh, in the United States, uh, was not a very active member uh, of it. And getting back to Ethan Allen, uh, we believe he more than likely took the first degree somewhere in Connecticut before he moved up here to what becomes Vermont, but was never really active uh, member of that. Uh, Ira Allen, uh, his brother, certainly was a uh, active member of that, uh, taking his uh, degrees in uh, the lodge in uh, Manchester. And the Masons at the time, when you think, when you uh, hear of a Mason's lodge, a lodge really refers to uh, two things. It's both the actual physical building where the Masons meet. The lodge is also a name of the group of men who form uh, that organization. Uh, for example, uh, I'm a member of Mount Mansfield Lodge Number 26, which we meet in Jericho, but that's also the name of our body of men that meet in that building. And it's very interesting, the early history of masonry in Vermont, in that masons do not have their own lodge buildings. They are quite literally meeting in taverns. They are meeting in the upper floors of members' houses. And they're making sure that uh, those meetings are what we call tiled, that they are uh, guarded by a member outside the door with a sword uh, during the meeting to prevent uh, eavesdroppers from uh, coming in. But those early meetings are held uh, in taverns, uh, which is uh, quite interesting. Uh, we have a policy today of uh, no alcohol uh, in the lodge uh, unless it's uh, dis distributed uh, through uh, a dispensation given to us by the Grand Master. But if you can imagine some of those early meetings in the taverns, uh, they must have been uh, quite jovial uh, at the time. Now, masonry in Vermont uh, continues. Now, remember, we have two lodges that are chartered in 1781 and 1785 by the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts. Uh, Vermont uh, early settlers at this time being largely from uh, Connecticut, like the Allens, uh, Massachusetts. But then in 17. 89, we have a third lodge chartered, and that is going to, to be Dorchester Lodge number three, which is actually going to be chartered by the Grand Lodge of Quebec, of all things. Uh, and that lodge is going to be founded in Virgins. So now we have two lodges in the southern part of the state chartered by Massachusetts. We have the first lodge in the northern part of the state that is going to be chartered by the Grand Lodge of Quebec. And the first master of that lodge, Dorchester Number 3, which is still in existence today down in Virgins, is going to be Thomas Chittenden. And if you can imagine, Chittenden has to travel from Williston, where he's living, down to Virgins uh, for meetings. Uh, generally at the time, uh, that was uh, the accepted uh, mode. Uh, masonry would often meet on an uh, afternoon uh, and uh, so members won't have to uh, travel at night. Uh, as time went on and a lot of uh, men were not able to make the uh, daytime meetings, a lot of the lodges become what we call moon lodges, where they would meet on the uh, night of the full moon. And uh, there's still a, a number of uh, lodges in Vermont today that actually still follow that schedule. They meet on, say, the Wednesday of the week of the full moon. Well, I can test to you as uh, somebody who's traveled to a lot of lodges around Vermont, 
If you don't know what the Wednesday of the week of the full moon is, you will show up on the night of the meeting and nobody will be there. So <laughs> it's always best to call ahead to figure out what day they're actually meeting. But uh, a lot of lodges do follow the, uh, the lunar cycle uh, during the, uh, the calendar year. So now, as we proceed into the 1780s, you know, remember Vermont, we're our own independent republic at this time. Well, we are going to get a uh, surge of uh, immigrants coming back in from Connecticut. And so, in 1790, we are going to charter through the Grand Lodge of Connecticut, uh, Temple Lodge in Bennington, and Union Lodge in Middlebury. So now Vermont has a very unique uh, situation going on. Uh, Vermont is its own uh, republic until 1791 when we joined the Union. And now there are five lodges in Vermont, two chartered by the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts, one chartered by the Grand Lodge of Quebec, and two chartered by the Grand Lodge of Connecticut. Now, after the American Revolution, there was an idea that was going to go on for a little bit to create a Grand Lodge of the United States with George Washington as the first Grand Master. So the Grand Master is sort of the, the head guy in charge of the whole show. With George Washington as the Grand Master of the United States. Well, it very quickly became apparent that we have 13 very independent group of men all with their own aims, all with their own views of masonry. So beginning with Massachusetts, Massachusetts after the American Revolution said, well, we're going to form our own Grand Lodge of Massachusetts. And then Connecticut's like, well, we're going to do the same thing. And so eventually all 13 of the original colonies that become the 13 original states all form their original Grand Lodge. Uh, breaking off from uh, the United Grand Lodge of England, where the initial uh, lodges that are in the uh, colonies that become the United States are chartered from. So now, as we get into Vermont statehood, we have 13 Grand Lodges in the United States. We also have uh, Grand Lodge of Quebec, uh, Grand Lodge of Ontario, uh, same thing up in Canada. Every uh, province uh, and territory of Canada is its own uh, independent Grand Lodge. Uh, unlike over in uh, Europe, where you often have uh, country Grand Lodges, like the United Grand Lodge of England. Uh, here in the United States, all 50 states uh, all have their Grand Lodge, and all are independent of each other uh, and really do their own thing, but all work uh, together to uh, better the existence of the craft. So now, in the summer of 1794, Vermont is a state. We've been a state for uh, three years. Uh, we've sent to uh, Washington uh, uh, what becomes our uh, first senator, uh, Moses Robinson, who was a member of Temple Lodge in Bennington. Uh, Thomas Chittenden is our first governor. And Vermont Masons are trying to debate where they want to go. Now, uh, you know, as more uh, folks move into Vermont, uh, masonry uh, starts getting popular with some of these new settlers who had been members uh, in their lodges back in their home states, notably Massachusetts, Connecticut, etc. And so in the summer of 1794, specifically on August 6th, an idea is put out by Thomas Chittenden and Noah Smith. Noah Smith is the first Chief Justice of the Vermont Supreme Court, that we now have these five lodges in Vermont that are all sort of doing their own thing. They're all uh, reporting back to their own Grand Lodges. They're paying their dues to Connecticut, to Massachusetts, to Quebec. But now that Vermont is a state, we're our own territory, and we have five working lodges in what is now Vermont, we should get together to form our own Grand Lodge of Vermont. So the call goes out in August of 1794. And the convention to form the Grand Lodge of Vermont meets from October 10th to October 14th, 1794. 
And uh, there, the men, the masters of those original five lodges, uh, including Thomas Chittenden and Noah Smith and Nathaniel Chipman, they work together to hammer out what eventually becomes the Grand Lodge of Vermont. And they, the original five lodges are rechartered. And on the afternoon of October 14th, 1794, a date I will never remember and my mother will never remember because it's my birthday, the Grand Lodge of Vermont is chartered. And they adopt the motto, the truth is older than the mountains. And uh, using the Vermont state uh, sem emblem with the famous square and compasses in that motto, the Grand Lodge of Vermont is chartered on that date and begins chartering lodges throughout the Green Mountain State. And the Grand Lodge is going to meet once a year on the second Tuesday after the first Monday in June. Again, there are some very interesting dates that you remember uh, as a member. And uh, they're going to meet in different places uh, throughout the state as uh, membership in masonry uh, continues to grow. So much so that by 1802, they've chartered nearly a dozen other lodges. So within eight years, masonry in Vermont really takes off like wildfowl hour. And there are lodges that are chartered all over the state. And some of the interesting things that uh, come up in the early records, uh, by 1802, uh, even though we've been a Grand Lodge for eight years, the individual lodges that have been chartered under Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Quebec, they're all sort of still doing their own thing. Uh, uh, you know, one thing with masonry uh, is a very much a, a ritualistic organization. Uh, and these five lodges are sort of all still following their own uh, individual uh, work. And so in 1802, uh, the first Grand Master of Vermont, who's Noah Smith, basically comes out and says, well, we have to come up with our own thing that is uniquely Vermont. And so they are going to adopt what becomes known as the web work, uh, something that's still in existence today. But believe it or not, it's not until the Civil War that they're able to report that every lodge in this state is working on its own, on its own way, doing its one thing, no matter where you go uh, in Vermont. And masonry in Vermont absolutely flourishes as, again, as more folks uh, move into this state. It's an organization that really picks up a lot of uh, these men being farmers. It's an organization that they uh, turn to uh, after a long day at the farm to go to the lodge to uh, meet with their brothers. Uh, Mason re Masons become very prominent in uh, local uh, and state affairs. Uh, certainly uh, the Chittenden family, uh, Thomas Chitten becomes the first deputy grandmaster, the number two man in Masons in Vermont. So Vermont Masons uh, continue to, just as they do today, continue to uh, serve their state in uh, all aspects of politics, and masonry continues to grow and to flourish throughout the Green Mountain State until something happens in the 1830s. And that is going to become what's known as the anti-Masonic movement. But that is another story for another day. So if you want to hear part two of this riveting lecture, that's probably even more exciting than what I've just talked about, maybe you'll have me back next year and we can talk about the anti-Masonic movement. Because believe it or not, Vermont actually elects a governor who runs for governor of Vermont on the anti-Masonic ticket. It's, it's absolutely fascinating, but it's another story for another day. Thank you so much. And I am happy to entertain any questions at this time. Yes, ma'am. Um, I don't want to embarrass myself by asking, but what's the difference between the Elks and the Masons? So a lot of, a lot of those uh, animal-related fraternities, um, you know, they really all do their own thing. And I'm, I'm not a member of those, so I can't speak to what, say, the moose, the Elks, the... the lions what what all of those groups do 
But I can tell you with Masonry, it's a group of men that really work together to better themselves and better their communities. And I'm sure those other organizations uh, work to do the same thing. But with Masonry, it's an organization that has been around since time in memoriam. Uh, it's one of those organizations that literally you can trace back the first uh, vestiges of it back to the 1300s. And it's, it's one of those things that my, my wife asked me a similar question when we first started dating. Like, what do you guys do? Like, we're, you're going to the lodge. What do you do there? And she eventually learned after being together for almost nine years now, go have fun at the lodge. I'll see you in a few hours. It's, <laughs> it's really hard to explain what it is without... Um, Giving away a secret. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Peter. Yeah, yes, ma'am. So the, the numbers really top out in about the 1920s. Um, at that point, there were, I believe, 12,000 members in the state. Um, after, it, it always seems to peak after a war. A lot of guys uh, experience masonry uh, in, when they're deployed, um, and they come back and they want to join. Um, but really, war, after World War I was the, the sort of the high point of masonry in Vermont. At that point, uh, there were uh, 12,000, 13,000 members. There were also 108 lodges at the time. Uh, fast forward 100 years, we've got presently about 3,000 members in about 75 lodges. So it's an organization that is still active, still around. Uh, and you know, it's one of those things that involves men from all walks of life. Uh, quite literally, you have guys who are engineers and professors sitting next to guys who flip hamburgers. But literally everyone in the meeting is on the level. And uh, certainly uh, a lot of younger guys are uh, coming into it, you know, realizing what it is, the benefits that it has, and are uh, joining. Yes, ma'am. Rising, Rising Sun Lodge, I've been there. So, so a lot, it, it really depends, and Vermont is really interesting where you will find what, what are Mason Lodges today. A lot of lodges that are built specifically for the Masons, they take it on as part of a civic project. So like, uh, for example, down in Bridport, the Masons put up half the money to build the town hall. And so the Masons got the second floor of the town hall. The, the first floor was the town hall. Same thing in Orleans. So you'll see buildings that are specifically built for the Masons, especially in Vermont where, you know, you, you need a town hall. You need a civic place to go and meet. So, for example, Valley Lodge, number 106 up in Orleans. Uh, their building doubles as the town hall, uh, town uh, music theater, and the Masons are up on the third floor. Uh, you'll also see Masons take over old buildings. For example, my lodge up in Jericho, we actually are in an 1830s former Baptist church. It's one of the oldest buildings in Jericho. And we are responsible for preserving an 1830s building. If you own an old house, you know what goes into that. But uh, we've been there for nearly 100 years now, and we're through you know, our funding, we are able to preserve one of the most historic buildings in the town uh, that we also uh, you know, allow scout groups, allow other civic groups to come in and use at the same time. Ma'am. Uh, could you explain the symbol? Oh, sorry. The symbol? The square and compass symbol? <coughs> well, I took, a, uh, I took a bit of an oath, <laughs> and um, I, I can just tell you it's a... Uh, it is a universally recognized uh, symbol of uh, masonry, uh, and it uh, teaches us to be good men. Good boy. <laughs> yes, ma'am. This, this may be outside your, your area of study, um, but uh, I'm, I'm just curious. My, my, uh, my grandfather, uh, I think he received, and actually one uh, very, very much valued some um, Masonic memorabilia 
And um, so he would have been the son of, uh, you know, a Jewish son of Jewish immigrants, would have been, you know, active in his career between, say, 1920 and 1960. Would he, I, and this would have been in Baltimore, Maryland. Yes. Would he have been, would, could he have been a member, or would he, would, would he probably so, not have been? So um, I do know um, I do know in Rhode Island. I grew up in Rhode Island that there there was a lodge chartered in Newport called Redwood Lodge that was for Jewish men. One of the tenets to be a member is to just have a belief in a supreme being, and it can be whatever you believe exists up out there. Um, but Masons like to keep records. We have records in my lodge going back to the 1850s. And the best thing to do would be to get in touch with the Grand Lodge of Maryland, uh, Baltimore, you said. So they would, if he was a member of a lodge in Maryland, they would have, when he came in, when he took his degrees, uh, what offices he might have held. And uh, the same is true for really any grand jurisdiction. Uh, Masons like to keep records, and there's records... Uh, you know, you can you can look up and know exactly when Thomas Chittenden joined the lodge, when he took his degrees, when he was master, because Masons like to keep records. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my, my list of questions was getting. That's fine. Okay. I think I just heard you say that one of the tenets of Masonry is a belief in a supreme being of whatever this is. Whatever, whatever. If, Whatever, it, whatever you believe in. So when someone comes knocking on the door to say, I'd like to be a member. Yes. Not literally. You know, yes. Unless it is literally. Um, <laughs> is, is there a listing of tenets that they're sort of... Uh, you have to be a man. Have you have to be a man, freeborn, so not born into slavery, which we don't have, obviously, anymore. You have to be of lawful age, over the age. Uh, it's now 18. It used to be 21. And uh, you have to go through an investigation. So um, bas investigation basically your background, your character. Um, you know, we don't want, don't want any bad apples joining. Um, but the, the, the religious piece, uh, Masons refer to what you might call God, Allah, as the supreme architect of the universe. And it's a, you, uh, you can have, I'll give you an example, when Rudyard Kipling became a Mason. He became a Mason in India. The night he took his degree, there were five holy books on the altar representing five different religions, including Islam, Hinduism, Christianity, Judaism, and some other Indian religion. So again, it's, it's, Masonry is not a religion, but it is religious in some of its teachings and beliefs, but it doesn't, you can come from any religion and be accepted. And the building at the head of Church Street, which is yes. referred to at least some months as the, a Masonic, the Masonic Temple? Yes. So that used to be the headquarters of the Grand Lodge of Vermont. So um, several organizations, including Washington Lodge Number no. 3, which is still active in South Burlington, the Scottish Rite Masons, different Masonic bodies, mm -hmm. but that was the headquarters of Masonry in Vermont. Um, and then as real estate prices uh, and numbers, st real estate prices went up, membership started going down, uh, the members realized, well, we, we better cash out. And uh, so they, they sold it back in, I believe, the 80s. Um, and it's, it was a gap last time I walked by. Last <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Yes. So the funds to do that is it's not inexpensive. Is it is it a, a matter of paying dues or fundraising or a combination? Uh, of a lot of a lot of a lot of masons when they pass away will remember the lodge in their will, and I'll um, I'll leave I'll leave it at that. We had a member in my old lodge, Ethan Allen. He was an oil man in Texas and didn't have didn't have any kids, didn't have a wife, and. When he passed away back in the late 90s, he was very generous to the lodge. That's, that's what I'll say about that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. One more question.
Uh, so cer certainly I'm not really an expert when it comes to those groups, but I, I it, probably in the early 1900s, um, I would say, um, you know, we refer to it as the Masonic family. Um, so we have the Order of Eastern Star, which m women are able to become members of, Demolay for younger boys, Rainbow Girls for, for younger women. Uh, but it really is a whole umbrella that embraces, you know, a, a family uh, group today. So thank you so much.